Good morning chaps, welcome along to the vlog. It's Friday, everyone's excited and uh, we're going to kick off the day with getting grain out for next week's brews. We're going to be brewing three batches or maybe even four batches of beer including the plum porter recipe that we put together yesterday. But before we do all of that, there are a few little jobs that we just have to finish off, like putting this probe in the mash tun. So first and foremost, this is a PT100. The probe that I actually installed was off a STC1000 and they're completely different. So we're gonna just swap them bad boys out. Easily done. As you can see, we've got all of the cooling sorted for the fermenters. And we've got some taps on there as well. I did put that one too low, which is a real bummer. But that's fine. We'll just uh, we'll use that one instead. <laughs> We're still waiting on motorised valves, but we can use fermenter number two controller on the panel there to keep that cold. And everything in here is, well, quite happy really. The two vacants that we've got need an extra dry hop today. And then everything needs to be set to cold crash. In fact, I can start the bitter right away. And then it's a case of filling all this up with water. And I'm going to actually do a few brews on it with the hoses and everything else that we had originally, just to kind of get my head around it before I go and cut the new hose, which is in that box, to the right sizes. Because after I've used it for a few times, I might change my mind where I want things. So I'm not going to dive right in and cock it up. And then over here, all we have to do is fill up the HLT, which I think is already full anyway. Uh, just have a quick rinse and put some acid in the plate chiller ready for next week. And make sure we set the timer on the control panel correctly. So when it comes on, it comes on in the morning Monday morning, so when we get here, we can just dough in and start brewing wonderful beer. Also a little bit of tidying up to do over here. This is the remnants of the soap, if you've not watched the soap making video. So that stuff has to go into the pub and then my bit has to go home. And then also the remnants of the uh, Plum Porter research. If you've not watched that, again, go to the channel and have a look for the plum porter recipe video. It's all there and uh, you can follow along on the brew day if you're so inclined. So I'm gonna pull the soldering iron out and bring it over to the brew kit because the brew kit is a bit heavy to wheel around actually. And then we'll just change out this PID probe. Right, we've got the probe switched out. And now we just need to kind of sleeve the whole thing and get it insulated, which is not as easy as you may think initially. So I was going to use some heat shrink tubing, but unfortunately we've had to kind of do these staggered solder connections here and uh, there wasn't really room for me to put any shrink sleeve on easily so I'm just going to tear a little bit of this insulation tape up and just kind of wrap it around the solder joint it's not my neatest work I might hasten to add but it will no doubt do the job and keep uh, keep these two from touching and looking at the probe I think this is bang on the temperature is much closer to ambient we'll of course reset that shortly and we're just going to put this bit of heat shrink on top of here and I'm hoping this will shrink down to the right size just by stroking it backwards and forwards with uh, the tip of the soldering iron 
and we've just covered the tip of the probe as well so that's kind of out of view if you know what I mean it's inside the actual shrink sleeve so it shouldn't be coming into contact with the wall of the mash tun I don't know if you can short these probes out because obviously they work on the resistance of a little piece of metal on the end platinum I think it is with them called PT100s I think there's a little bit of platinum on the end and the resistance in the platinum changes with the temperature of the metal and uh, the PID then reads that resistance value in ohms and calculates what temperature the probe is at. I'm not sure about the math behind it all but I'm pretty sure that's how it all works. Right, I can see that this isn't shrinking up as much as I would like it to and I can still see the PT100 at the end there so I'm just going to pop on a little bit of maybe the red would be more suitable just a little bit of red heat shrink there I could do with buying some more of this with some different sizes and if I can get that to go on and in the end <laughs> I don't know how I managed that but it worked so you'll do for me fella and then we'll just shrink this down get it nice and tight touch my finger while I'm at it well done son and then we're gonna stick that in there that is still really hot actually I'll just shrink that back a bit and then this when it's fully inserted like that is going nowhere and that is the probe for the mash tun complete there we go so let's go to the other side. You can't see that thermal well, can you? I've just done that out of shot. There it is. So let's go to the other side and we'll check the values on the PID. So here we are, the mash PID. At the moment it's reading 36 degrees C, but we have just had the soldering iron on it. And it seems to be coming down nicely. And there is what the boil kettle is reading as ambient temp, 21. And just across here, we've got the HLT reading at 18. So I've brought across, here it is, I've brought across one of my brewing thermometers which I'll calibrate it to 0 0.1 degree. We'll stick that in the hole and see if we can't line them all up. I think that's reading 16 in here today so I guess that's where we want to be with these. Okay, so in the distance, just fallen off over there, you can see that red dangly thermometer. Oh yes, indeed, that is the thermometer I'm using to calibrate the mash ton uh, PID. And it's reading 16 degrees, and this one's reading 13.5, so we need to increase the temperature by two and a half. So we hold the set button until this comes up and then we scroll through until we reach I can't ask, I think it's SC is the uh, is that it that's it and then we want to be increasing this value by 2.5 there we go and then we continue to scroll through until we go through all of the eight uh, EP settings and when we get to number nine it goes back normal again and we've got 16.2 degrees on there and unfortunately for me now the uh, other thermometer has dropped down to 15.9 so we're close but no cigar I might go back in and just tweak it by that 0.1 just to make sure that we are spot on and a lot of the times I go straight past the setting I want uh, so we're gonna come down there we go 
So now we should have matching figures on both thermometers or from both thermoprobes. So we've got 16 degrees on the money and over here we have indeed, it's warming up now because I've got it in my hand, we've got 16.1. 16.1, beautiful. That's good enough for the girls I go out with. So now that job is complete, another one which I want to address is the spar arm, the rotating spar arm. So whilst this is completely suitable for larger kits, such as the 500 litre one, unfortunately in here, it doesn't seem to work very well because you're not actually putting that much flow into the spar arm. So I'm gonna take this off and we're gonna fabricate a stainless steel sparge arm similar to the ones that they offer on the SS Brutech website. Let's go for it. So like all good projects should, this one starts in the scrap bin and what I'm looking for is essentially a couple of discs. So I've got a few here, another one there. I think that might just do us, is that one? There we go, there's another big disc there. So we'll take like the roundest of these discs. That's the biggest, but that's the roundest. And uh, we'll take this, I use this to cut off little bits of stainless steel for a probe. It cleans up, this is just copper sulfate stuck to the side of it from uh, a chiller that it came out of. So we'll take this and we'll take this and we'll use both of these and we'll see if we can put something together. So the plan is, if combined maybe this disc with a blank plate from a uh, press blank RJT, then maybe we can just have a little standoff like that. You see how it like, makes a little hat? And then out the bottom, we have a pipe, a piece of this copper pipe here, running to our connector. So we plug our connector in, and this little fellow stands up in the air like that, and uh, the work goes through, up, hits the top cap, spreads sideways, runs off the edge. That's the plan. I'm gonna see if I can tidy the edges of this up, put all the components together, and uh, tack it up, and then we'll have a little lucky poo before we actually weld it up, and, uh, and see if the concept's gonna work once it's tacked. Right, this is hot off the welder, so what I've decided to do with this one is uh, I've taken a blanking cap from the cam locks, the snap lock cam blanking cap, and I've welded on a little upright, so this can now clamp into uh, the side of the mash tun like that, and then it will have its little upright section in here. So we're gonna take this disc next, and we're gonna weld that onto there. Uh, I might do that after I've welded this cap onto there. And all I'm gonna do to put that on is make three little spacers out of some scrap to lift it up and off the plate like that. And then we'll tack the, oh, I don't know actually, because if I put that on first, I can weld from the inside, can't I? Yeah, maybe I'll put the pipe on first and then we'll come back and add this afterwards. Weld the three spacers to there, drop it on, and then tack the three spacers onto there. I think that sounds like a good plan. Right, so I've installed the disc onto the uh, fitting. Kind of looks like something out of Star, what, Star Trek. Hey the left ear, the right ear, and the final front ear. So I think that if we just turn the ampage way down on the torch, maybe maybe 35 amps would be too much, I'm not sure. And then I'm just gonna flow the edge of the uh, 
the pipe into the disc. If I can. Right, we're off. Very, very delicate operation. Not helped at all by shaky hands. But I think, I think I've got it. I think we've managed to do that actually. That was a real tricky little weld. But if I bring you close up and have a look, you can really see how fine that bead actually had to be to get that to take. And, well, it's pretty damn solid, quite frankly. So I don't think I'm gonna play with that anymore. So now all we need to do is make that top section. And you know what? We are getting closer and closer to something that actually looks like a good sparge fitting. Well, here we have it, folks. The Starship Enterprise. <laughs> oh my God, it gets worse. So what do you think to that? That is gonna be our sparge assembly instead of that rotating sparge arm, which I wasn't actually too keen on. I like them and all, but quite frankly, they just don't seem to stand up to slow sparge rates. So this little beauty is going to go into the mash tun and we'll give him a little bit of a whirly-poo test today. And if it's all good, then I'll clean up all these spots on the back and whatnot from the, uh, from the welding. But I think that looks pretty good. So we made it out of the scrap bin. Well, there should be an action, folks. Yes, so you may notice there's something a little different about that. Uh, the top disc was too big and too flat, and it didn't do this. And it also sprayed over the edge. Whereas this one, now that we've altered it a little bit, doesn't quite hit the edges. But as you can see, makes a nice little sprinkly pattern. And if we turn the power down a little bit, then this is probably where we're gonna be during the sparge. And you get to see a nice uh, fountain of water. Maybe we can just slightly twist it, to spread it out a bit more evenly. Not 100% what I wanted, but it's working. And you know what? It kind of looks pretty cool, don't you think? I reckon it does anyway. So yeah, I'm not sold on it folks, but it's it's probably as functional as the original rotating spar jam was when it doesn't rotate. So oh look at that. That looks pretty cool. Put the bubbles in there. Anyway, enough prattling about. We've got loads to do today. And it's nearly time for home, so let's turn that off. That's working perfectly well now. Let's also grab the tripod because we've made a breakthrough folks and we've decided to go ahead and pick up a few things this week from the malt miller. So I talked about doing this many, many months ago and yesterday or the day before, we kind of popped our cherry on it and I've only gone and ordered the tilt yes but i've really gone for it big time because we've ordered one for each fermenter so we've got we've actually got four but uh we've got two in some sanitizer here i've got a tilt black in the fe1 and this here is a tilt pink so you have to get all the different colours, otherwise they won't work. So here it is folks, Tilt Pink. And we've had them up and running already. And uh, I've had a look at the data that it broadcasts to Google Docs. And everything looks okay. The big test for me, of course, 
was is it going to be able to communicate through the stainless steel tanks so with the aid of a Galaxy Tab 6 we are here as you can see it is displaying and we had a we received a signal from the tilt black not less than 30 seconds ago so it appears to be working and there are the tanks just behind us so obviously we can't have them too tight too close should I say don't know if you can see this it's just is that visible on the camera let's go to the other side of the fermenters where there's a bit of shade from this sun and have a look a little bit more at the data so we brought the tablet in because of course we can just uh, kind of leave this plugged in at the side of the tanks and the idea is when I come in every day and uh, we take readings for the FVs it's a real pain in the arse having to crack open the valve take a reading drop a hydrometer in sanitize the valve put the hydrometer away all that kind of jazz and uh, I could basically do without it frankly so having the tilts means that uh, all of this data is logged for us as you can see there they are so the black is in the bitter and it's reading 1009 which means it's pretty close to our predicted final gravity um, well it might have even surpassed it I don't think it's actually on there is it target SG target FG there we go 1008 to 1009 so that is pretty much done so we've got to get some we've got to get some findings adjunct in there shortly but uh, that's the data on the tablet so I can record that on here or monitor it so I can drop in the dry hops at the perfect point every time for every beer but let's just go upstairs into the orifice and quickly have a look at what data has been pulled up on the tilt spreadsheet so here it is yes we're back in the orifice again folks and tilt black well there we go look at that so we've actually got real-time data so you can see the point here where we dropped it in to the tank at 207 and it's been pinging back data ever since and the temperatures remain stable one thing I wasn't clear about when I ordered one of these tilts is how do you chart all of the data onto a graph well I don't use Google Docs very often as you may have gathered if I don't know that there's a handy little tool here look that says insert chart and bosh as if by magic there is a chart so you can have line charts you can have scatter charts you can have all different types of chartage and uh, well yeah really useful information to have in front of you and now another good thing about this is as well we can go to our brew management software we use Viewplan BMS and we can open up our brew management fermenters are here these are all the fermenters that we've got and if we go into this little section here on Conical 1 we click that there and it allows you to save documents and those saved documents can take the form of a URL so here I've stuck the tilt log into that document and if I scroll across and click on view doc where does it take us? you got it straight to the tank one tilt black Google document perfect and that will obviously be there forevermore and you can save a hard copy if you so require but I think this is good enough and of course it means I've got access to all of this data and I can do side-by-side -side comparisons on every single 
fermentation profile on every single guile in the future to see uh, if we have a really good batch what went right and if we have a bad batch what went wrong although we very rarely have a bad batch it does happen though so there we go that was a bit of a purchase um, that I guess surprised you guys out there but I'm already pleased with how it's operating it took no setting up at all I'd advise you to get one yes it did cost us a lot of money to get those four tilt hydrometers I think it was there were 150 quid each including VAT fortunately the pub is VAT registered so we'll be claiming that back at some point um, that brings the price down to about 129 excluding taxes still a lot of money though but for the amount of work it's going to save me this side then I think it's worth it it'll pay itself back in a year or so and uh, it's something that we can play with on the channel uh, makes interesting viewing if nothing else doesn't it right that's enough of me sat up here you know we've got uh, a busy Friday actually and I think I'm just about done for the vlog so what we're gonna do is wrap the vlog up now so I can get on with a few other projects and we'll come back maybe tomorrow or if not Monday with another update on what's going on in the brewery we'll see you then cheers <laughs>